So guys, today comes with a disclaimer. I am really having a hard time forming coherent sentences. Um, seriously, I, yay, yay. And it's not just academically. Like, um, I'm just having a hard time even engaging in casual conversation. Like my brain is starting to shut down. Um, so we're gonna get through this together. Um, but guys, if you find that we're talking about things and it starts to sound like, whoa, we're, be sure to ask questions because seriously, this is, this is, it's, I think I may be having a stroke. <laughs> All right. I really need a nap. Um, so guys, here's where we are. We now understand, and I appreciated the conversation that we just had. I, I, I trust that together we have a, a fairly comfortable grasp of intermolecular forces. Well guys, today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the so what's. Um, not all of them, but we're going to talk about the so what's. Um, some of the so what's we've already talked about. Last year we talked about boiling point, inter, uh, adhesive and cohesive forces, and we related those to intermolecular forces. We're going to talk about that quickly. Um, then guys, we're going to talk about some so what's that we haven't talked about. Um, most specifically, vapor pressure. This is big and you've got to understand it and it's a little counterintuitive. Um, so we're going to talk about vapor pressure. Then when we're done with that, we're going to sort of call time out. Um, we understand that, that intermolecular forces determine the phases that substances exist in, right? Strong intermolecular forces tend to be solids. Weak intermolecular forces tend to be gases, and there's sort of a continuum to that. Well, guys, we're going to call time out, and we're going to talk about solids, liquids, and gases in the context of the conditions that allow them to exist in those three phases. And we're going to have that conversation relative to what are called phase diagrams. Um, and so we're going to dig into phase diagrams today. Then, guys, what we're going to do to wrap up this unit on Monday is we're going to come back to intermolecular forces and we're going to talk a little bit more about the so what's and we're going to talk about solubility. Because remember, intermolecular forces are the forces that cause things to dissolve into each other. So did that all make sense? So all of this is the practical applications of intermolecular forces. We're gonna start by reviewing last year, then we're gonna talk about some new stuff, including vapor pressure, then we're gonna call time out, talk about phase diagrams so that we have a better understanding of solids, liquids, gases. We'll talk a little bit more about solids, then on Monday we're gonna come back to the practical stuff and relate it back to solubility and talk about why do some things dissolve in other things while other things don't? Do you see how we're going to play this out? Okay. So guys, with that said, let's review first. If you don't need to write that down, I would suggest that that's better. But here's the scoop. Guys, we are going to take intermolecular forces and we are going to talk for the next two days about how many of the things that we know about solids, liquids, and gases and solutions on Monday tie back to intermolecular forces. So guys, we're going to talk about liquids first. You ready? This is review. So we're now going to connect intermolecular forces to the things that we know are true about liquids. So guys, to do this, you need a mental picture. I would propose to you that if you understand this mental picture of liquids, you understand everything that you need to know. So first of all this, how do we know that this picture is a liquid and not a solid and not a gas? First of all, how do we know it's not a solid? It's not regular and repeated, right? It's got relatively high entropy. There's a good thought. Then guys, how do we know that this is not a gas? 
Yeah, there aren't three of them. They're too close. And guys, what do these red lines represent? Intermolecular forces. So, based upon this understanding of a liquid, and maybe if it's helpful, we could even do this, and we could put it in a beaker. Guys, let's then talk about the things that we already know to be true about liquids. First of all, viscosity. Do you remember this from last year? Yeah, so if you don't remember, guys, viscosity is defined as a liquid's resistance to flow. I don't think we talked about this last year, but I can explain it to you now. You guys know how they measure viscosity? They do. They actually measure viscosity. Sometimes they measure viscosity in velocity units, meters per second. Um, well, actually centimeters per second. Literally what they do is they take a graduated cylinder and, you've, and you can buy these. They're called viscosity meters. Um, you, you, it's, a, it's a long, it's a, tall, gra it's a tall, narrow graduated cylinder. And what you do is it's, it's um, calibrated. And there's a line on the graduated cylinder and you fill the thing up to the line. And then there's a, typically it's steel. There's a steel ball of a predetermined mass and, and size. And you, uh, you, you drop the ball into the cylinder and then you time how long it takes for it to fall to the bottom and that can then be converted into viscosity units um, and so the more viscous the liquid the uh, the um, the longer it takes the ball to fall so guys what then does viscosity depend upon intermolecular forces so guys this isn't in the notes but this is what you've got to understand is it a direct or an inverse relationship to intermolecular force the higher the intermolecular force is, the higher the viscosity. If you don't understand that, you may want to write it down. But whether you're writing it down or not, that should be very troubling to you. So guys, why should that be troubling to you? Well, let me get you some liquid. Here's water. What do you know about the intermolecular forces in water? Not pretty strong. They're stupid strong. What kind of forces are those? Those are hydrogen forces. But what do you know about the viscosity of water? It's ridiculously low. So just a second. So now let's talk about something that is high viscosity. When you think of high viscosity, what do you think of? molasses, sugars, oils, honey, things like that. And guys, whether it's oil or syrup or molasses or whatever it is, guys, those are relatively low polarity molecules and yet they're very viscous. So what's the contradiction? Why is it that water with a high polarity, well, in hydrogen forces, has a low viscosity and yet let's say motor oil, Motor oil is made of large, very nonpolar molecules, and yet those things have high viscosities. What's going on? Talmadge, is this where you were headed, or you want to talk about something else? Well, if it's something else, wait. Can, did, where, where you think? Can you count something like honey as a liquid? Because it's kind of like water, but it's not Well, it's a solution, but it's still a liquid. Yeah, so, and if we added salt to water, it would still have a low viscosity, even though the salt strengthens the intermolecular forces, right? When we add salt to water, the intermolecular forces are actually strengthened. That's why the boiling point goes up. So adding salt to that doesn't change the viscosity, and it only furthers the contradiction. Go ahead. So is there some other element? Ex exactly. There's another factor. What's the difference between water and motor oil molecules? Not quite mass, the size. Guys, motor oil molecules can't get out of the way of the ball. They're so big that, that they just, they're in the way. And as the ball falls, it's literally having to push these molecules out of the way. Where the water molecules, while they are tightly bound, they're so small that they just run out of the way as the ball falls through. 
It's the major predictor. Yeah, so guys, understand viscosity's major predictor is not intermolecular force. It is dependent upon intermolecular force, but its major predictor is actually molecular size. You get on that? Okay, so then guys, the other two, which are a little more straightforward, adhesive and cohesive forces. These again are review from last year. Um, both of them depend upon intermolecular forces. Um, yeah, so let, that's what I wanted to talk about. And so, well, uh, be careful. Let's talk. So, um, guys, first of all, let, let's, let's define them. So adhesive forces are the forces between different substances. If you're having a hard time thinking about that or making sense of that, um, if you think of, of adhesive, adhesive is glue, right? And what does glue do? Sticks dissimilar things together. So adhesion, adhesive, thinking of glue, and it'll help you keep it straight. Guys, these are forces that exist between different substances. And then cohesive forces are forces that exist within the same substance. Now understand, they're both, they're both dependent upon intermolecular forces. So are they direct or inverse relationships? They're direct. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the stronger the adhesive or cohesive forces. And that is why water is so adhesive and cohesive. Yeah. yeah. So, guys, now let's talk about the difference because, Jake, you said something interesting. You said adhesive is, um, no, you said cohesive is intramolecular. You've got to be careful because yesterday or the day before, we defined intramolecular as bonding. So when we talk about, they're, they're both between, they're between different, well, they're between particles. They're not within particles, they're between particles. It's just that in cohesive, they're the same particles, and in, in adhesive, they're different particles. So yeah, so let, let's maybe play this game and see if this makes sense. So you guys know what kind of artist I am, so I don't want to hear about it. How'd I do? It's a Chevy. Okay, so guys, here's the deal. When, well, let me say it differently. So imagine that my Chevy is like circa 1970s, right? It hasn't been washed in forever and it certainly hasn't been waxed. So guys, if you've got an old car that hasn't been well taken care of, and if it rains on your car, what does the water do? It forms big puddles, right? What force causes this water to just get the whole top of the car wet? Are they adhesive or cohesive? They are adhesive forces. Guys, the idea is this. The paint that they use to paint your car, paint molecules, are relatively polar. And so what happens is if, you're, if rain is falling for all intensive purposes right on the paint, paint is polar, water we know to be polar, and the water adheres, right? The water adheres to the paint and the, it just gets the whole hood of your car wet. So what do you do to fix that? Well, guys, you wax your car, right? So if we come along and if we, let me see if I can get rid of this. If we, no, let me keep going. If we come along and we wax the hood of our car, wax molecules are relatively nonpolar. So why are they a solid? Because 
because they're so big. But guys, wax molecules, and remember big is polarizable, right? So guys, the idea here is that these wax molecules are relatively nonpolar. So when water falls on your newly waxed car, what happens to the attraction between the water and the hood of the car? It goes down because the water, or I'm sorry, the wax is not polar. So the water cannot add here to the hood of your car because the wax is nonpolar. So those cohesive forces are weakened. And guys, if those cohesive forces are weakened, then the adhe, I'm sorry, said that backwards. The adhesive forces are weakened, the adhesion between the water and the car. The adhesive forces are weakened. Now, all of a sudden, the cohesive forces become important and the water forms droplets and rolls right off the hood. You get the idea? So it's a wonderful practical example of adhesion versus cohesion. Guys, the water will adhere to the hood of the car until you put a wax layer on it, which is nonpolar. The nonpolar wax, the water can't adhere to it. Cohesion becomes important. They ball up and roll right off. Does that make sense? Someone was going somewhere. Matt was, I don't remember, I ignored someone. Yeah, they're still, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right, so, I mean, let me do this on the back of the car. It does this, right? It doesn't lay down one molecule thick. So there is st still some cohesion, but the adhesion is relatively stronger, allowing it to spread out than it does here, where it just balls up because cohesion is all but gone, adhesion is all but gone. You guys okay with the idea? Does it make you want to go wax your car? Probably not. You could go wax my truck, though, if you want. All right, so guys, let's get rid of this. That was a lovely car. So guys, this is all review, right? Any questions about adhesion, cohesion, viscosity? Good? All right, now guys, here comes the new stuff, vapor pressure. So guys, allow me to put this in context for you. When we talked about when, yeah, so when, when we have talked about vapor pressure already, because we already have, in what context have we already talked about vapor pressure? Kind of, but not directly. It was in lab, but we talked about it in here as well. When did we talk about vapor pressure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, we went to the back of our book and on, on page 10, oh, I even have it marked. Page 1058, we have this table, which is the table of vapor pressures of water, right? And you don't need to go back there. I'm just trying to, trying to activate some memories here, guys. And we talked about the idea that if we have a, uh, remember, our trough, and then if we have this, we understand that this is not just the gas that's trapped. This also contains water vapor because the water is evaporating into the space. Does that ring a bell? Okay, guys, that is what is called, well, let me say it differently. The pressure that this water exerts inside that space is what is called vapor pressure. Now, what does vapor pressure depend upon? the temperature of the water. So the warmer the water, right? The warmer the water, what happens to vapor pressure? Does it go up or down? It goes up. So the warmer the water, the higher the vapor pressure. But guys, what we need to do now with vapor pressure is relate it back to intermolecular forces. So we're gonna do this twice. I'm gonna show you a video that relates vapor pressure to temperature, and then we're gonna come back and unpack it and talk about it relative to intermolecular forces. So I may have to restart this depending on where my sound is, but let's see what happens. Oops, sorry, hold on. Where's the video? Oh, you know what, hold on. Here we go. Oh gosh. 
I wanted to show you, oh, you know what? Let me just fix this. The and yeah, but it was supposed to come in second instead of last. Um, let's see what happens. Okay. A liquid confined to a cylinder is shown here with no other sound. Okay, so sound is good. But guys, familiarize yourself with what you're looking at here. So we've got water. We've got a contained space, right? Vapor pressure doesn't happen in open beakers because it just goes away. It's got to be contained just like it is in our graduated cylinders in the water trough. So this is contained. Guys, here we've got temperature, here we've got pressure, and they are going to graph temperature versus vapor pressure. In your brain, think through this. What's that graph gonna look like? Which way will the line go? Bottom left to top right or top left to bottom right? Bottom left to top right. What kind of relationship is that? Direct, here we go. A liquid confined to a cylinder, as shown here, with no other substances present, exerts a vapor pressure in the space above it. Molecules continuously transfer back and forth between the gas and liquid. Now guys, make sure you understand that. This is an equilibrium process. You always have molecules that are escaping. But once these molecules have escaped and they're bouncing around up here in the vapor phase, what happens if they run back into the surface of the liquid? They stick. And so guys, understand that they are vaporizing and condensing simultaneously. Joel, would you turn around and help Talmadge? Oh, he got it. Never mind. Okay, so guys, you good on that? I, oh, wasn't even his. Do you understand the idea that they are vaporizing and condensing simultaneously? Um, let's watch. You guys okay? With phases, the gas pressure in the cylinder represents the vapor pressure of the liquid that results from this equilibrium. Did you catch that? No, listen again the vapor pressure of the liquid that did you catch it the vapor pressure of the liquid guys this is critical to your understanding when we talk about vapor pressures we assign the vapor pressure not to the vapor but to its liquid that's going to be critical. Keep that in mind. So when you look up the vapor pressure in that table at the end of your uh, book, you're, you're looking up the, the numbers that you're looking up, we assign to the liquid and not to the vapor. It is the pressure of the vapor, but we say it's the vapor pressure of the liquid. Results from this equilibrium. As the temperature of the cylinder increases, the average kinetic energy of the molecules increases in both the liquid and gas phases. A higher average kinetic energy facilitates the escape of molecules from the liquid phase into the gas phase. At the same time, the rate of return of gas phase molecules to the liquid also increases. A new equilibrium point is reached at a higher gaseous vapor pressure. The increase in vapor pressure with temperature is exponential. In this equation, we don't need to worry about the math. So guys, this is what you need to understand. We're going to now relate this to intermolecular forces. So let's talk. So looking at our liquid, what are the force? Let's say it's water. So looking at our liquid, what are the forces that are keeping these water molecules in the liquid phase? Hydrogen forces. Now, we understand, well, maybe I should ask this as a question. What do we know about the relative speeds of those molecules down in the liquid phase? Are they all going the same speed? No. no. They have a wide range of speeds. And some of them, even below the boiling point, some of them have enough energy to break their intermolecular forces and go into the vapor phase. What do we call that process? Evaporation. It's not boiling. Guys, so what then is the definition of boiling? When an average molecule has enough energy to break apart. Think about that. 
Let's talk about that while it's sort of before us. So the idea is this, guys. In a liquid, some molecules are moving slow. Some molecules are moving fast. Those fast molecules, if they get to the surface, may have enough energy to break their intermolecular forces and go away. That's called evaporating. What then is boiling? Boiling is when an average molecule has that much energy. Do you see the difference? Okay, so guys, with that said, some of these molecules are moving fast enough that they can jump into the vapor phase and they can evaporate. Now they're running around as a vapor up in that space and they're creating a pressure, right? But if one of these molecules hits the surface of the liquid, what do they do? They stick. When they hit, their intermolecular forces become effective because they're now close to each other and they stick. And when they stick, they return to the liquid phase. And eventually, guys, what we get is an equilibrium where they are leaving and returning at the same rate. And the pressure at which that occurs is the vapor pressure of the liquid. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, guys, watch this. What happens when we heat this up. Well, when, oh, you know what I meant to do. When we heat this up, guys, look at what happens. Now that we've heated this up, what did that do to the liquid? What did it do to the liquid? What did it do to the liquid molecules? Made them move faster. And if they're moving faster, that means more of them have enough energy to do what? jump into the vapor phase. So now we have more leaving to the vapor phase. But guys, because they have all this extra energy now, there's the possibility that they then run into the surface of the liquid and they don't stick, they bounce. They've got so much energy, they could hit and bounce without sticking. And so what we end up with is a disrupted equilibrium. We end up with more of this happening and less of this happening because we, the, the liquid's got more energy, these molecules are flying out with more energy, and when they hit, they may not any longer stick. You get the idea? Does it stay like that? No. So what happens? Well, guys, as this goes on, what's happening to the pressure in this space? It's increasing, and guys, why doesn't it then just continue to increase forever? Because guys, as this pressure increases, not only does the pressure out increase, but also the pressure down increases. And eventually the pressure down drives these molecules back into the liquid phase, even though they have more energy. So yeah, they're moving faster, but when they hit the liquid, eventually they can no longer bounce because the pressure's pushing them back down. And what ends up happening is this equilibrium, let me clean up my mess, this equilibrium, uh, you think I'd learn, this equilibrium, guys, becomes reestablished at a higher temperature. Do you get the idea? But understand that the new equilibrium that's been established is at a higher pressure. Why is it that the pressure can remain higher? Because these molecules are moving faster and the likelihood of them hitting and bouncing is increased. Eventually the pressure catches up with it, drives them back into, back into the liquid phase, but that then happens with more of these molecules in the gas phase and the pressure goes up. Do you get the idea? So let's talk about it. What questions do you have? You good? You sure? You're okay? Yeah? Okay. So now, guys, let's do this. Let's reset the clock, and now let's have this conversation. What if this isn't water anymore? What if this... What if this is... What if this is methanol? And guys, if you don't understand this, let me grab some. Guys, this is methanol. There's no water in here. This is methanol. It's CH3OH. If you can't picture it, it's 
it looks like this. And that's the only thing that's in here. The only thing in this flask is CH3OH. There's no water. So guys, what are the forces that hold this together as a liquid? How do you know they're hydrogen forces? Where, where do you see that? We've got a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen, so this proton becomes naked. We've got our unbonded pair of electrons right there. So guys, the forces that hold this together are hydrogen forces. So here's the question. How do the hydrogen forces in methanol compare to the hydrogen forces in water? Which ones are stronger? Why are the, water, why are the hydrogen forces in water stronger? because the water molecules are smaller and they can get closer together. Now, guys, how do we know that practically? Well, guys, if you, do you remember when I did this in class last year where you spill the methanol on the counter and then you rub it around? Did any of you actually stand up and watch this last time? You can actually watch it evaporate. Guys, this stuff evaporates so fast that it's almost, well, here, let me smear it out again. It, it, it really, I mean, I, can you see that from where you are? You can actually watch it evaporate. If I spilled a similar amount of water up here, it would be here for the rest of the, the, rest of the class period. So guys, why does methanol evaporate so much more quickly than water? its intermolecular forces are weaker and it can fly apart more readily. Now guys, apply that same idea to this. If we replace this with methanol, what's true of these intermolecular forces? They're weaker. So will more or less molecules jump into the vapor phase? More. So what will be true of the vapor pressure at any given temperature compared to water? It'll be higher. That's what you need to understand about vapor pressure. First of all, within a substance, if the temperature goes up, the vapor pressure goes up. Can you picture why, given what we talked about a minute ago? Then, guys, comparing substances to each other, what is the relationship? Which substances will have higher vapor pressures relative to intermolecular forces? weaker intermolecular forces. So guys, that's what you need to understand. You need to understand that vapor pressure is temperature dependent, which means the higher the temperature, the higher the vapor pressure. You also need to understand that within comparing substances, oh, this doesn't know what to do now. Guys, let me just get rid of this. Um, how do I, how should I do this? Let me copy paste. No, not that. Let me copy and paste this slide, then delete this, and then we'll come back to it this way and I'll fix it later. So guys, the idea is this. We're comfortable with the idea that the higher the temperature is, the higher the vapor pressure is. That's not even gonna be in your notes. The other thing that you need to understand is the relationship between intermolecular force strength and vapor pressure. So guys, the idea is this, the vapor pressure is the pressure of the gas supported over a liquid, but guys, we understand that it is inversely related to the intermolecular forces within the liquid. So the thought is this, higher intermolecular forces means it takes more energy for these things to escape. Because that's the case, these things then have lower vapor pressures. And guys, maybe we should eat, well, we can probably leave it there. Um, but that's the relationship that you need to understand. Is that okay? Are you good? Do you need another second to write it down? You okay? So guys, let's add this one last thought then and bring it back to something we've already talked about. If you have a liquid then with strong intermolecular forces, what will its vapor pressure be, high or low? Let's do it again. If you've got strong intermolecular forces in the liquid, what will the vapor pressure be, high or low? Low. 
what will the boiling point be? High. Guys, add that fourth thought. So low vapor pressures equal high boiling points. Do you need to talk about why or do you see it? Process that for a second. Low vapor pressures mean high boiling points. Does that just seem intuitive or do we need to talk about it? Low vapor pressure doesn't fall apart very easily. It takes more energy to boil it. Is that okay? Right, right. Exactly, precisely. You good with that? So guys, we can then relate this back to um, volatility and boiling point. These are things that we talked about last year. Remember, volatility is the ability of a substance to evaporate. Boiling point is the temperature at which it boils. And these also tie back to intermolecular forces. So the stronger the intermolecular forces, the lower the volatility because it doesn't evaporate readily. That relates to vapor pressure. So if you have highly volatile liquids, they will have high vapor pressures. But then conversely, they'll have low boiling points because they will boil very readily. So guys, you've got to be able to make all these interconnections. Anything you want to talk about? You guys good? Okay, so I'm done with this. Those are the applications that you need to understand about intermolecular forces right now. When we come back on Monday, we're going to talk about solubility. But for now, this is what you need to understand. If you guys are comfortable, we're going to now call time out and we're going to look at phase diagrams for about 15 minutes and call it a day. You guys good? Can I go on? Okay. Well, probably not, because while water has a vapor pressure, all of the stuff that's dissolved in there yeah, is a solid. Is there any other that have yes, right, yeah, and so you would, and you would end up with a combination of all of their vapor pressures. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly, yeah, it's, it would be a mix, exactly, yep. You guys good? All right, so guys, here we go. So, do you remember looking at phase diagrams when you summarize chapter 11? Do you remember these things? If you don't, guys, they look like this. This is a phase diagram. Notice that the x-axis is temperature. Notice that the y-axis is pressure. Now, guys, what you've got to be able to do is interpret locations and regions and transitions between regions on the on a phase diagram. The other thing that you've got to be able to do with this is differentiate between the phase diagram of water and the phase diagram of every other substance on this planet. They're different. Guys, why would the phase diagram of water be different than the phase diagram of every other substance around? It expands when it freezes. And guys, water is the only plentiful substance on Earth that does. There are some exotic, weird substances that we dig up milligrams of them in the middle of nowhere that actually do expand when they freeze as well. But guys, for an all intensive purposes, water is the only thing that does. So again, you've got to know the regions. You've got to know the relationships. You've got to understand changes between them. And you've got to understand the unique difference between the phase diagram of water and everything else. So guys, the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to show you a video about phase diagrams. We'll probably watch it a couple times and pick it apart. And then guys, at that point, we'll go through some slides that highlight those important points. Then we'll talk only very briefly about solids and call it a day. So here we go.
A phase diagram indicates the temperature and pressure conditions under which a substance is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. The lines that separate the phases are called phase boundaries. At any point along a phase boundary, the phases exist in equilibrium with one another. For example, in the phase diagram of water at one atmosphere of pressure and 100 degrees Celsius, liquid water and water vapor exist in equilibrium. This point is known as the normal boiling point of water. Likewise, the temperature at which solid and liquid water are in equilibrium at one atmosphere of pressure is known as the normal melting point. The point at which all three phase boundaries come together is known as the triple point. This corresponds to the temperature and pressure combination at which all three phases of a substance exist simultaneously in equilibrium. When a sample of solid water or ice at one atmosphere of pressure is heated, it will melt when the normal melting point, zero degrees Celsius, is reached. At this point, water crosses the solid-liquid phase boundary. If the sample is heated further, the liquid water's temperature will increase until it reaches the normal boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius. It will then vaporize, crossing the liquid-gas phase boundary. Once the liquid is all vaporized, the temperature of the water vapor will increase as more heat is added. If a sample of solid water is heated at a pressure below the triple point, it will sublime rather than melt as the temperature increases because the only phase boundary it will cross is that between the solid and vapor phases. Can you think of a substance that does that you're familiar with? Dry ice, carbon dioxide. So guys, what do you know about the pressure of the triple point of dry ice? What does it have to be? Above one atmosphere. We'll talk in a minute. We can also track the changes in a sample of water as we vary pressure. If the pressure is increased on a sample of water vapor at 110 degrees Celsius, it will condense as it crosses the gas-liquid phase boundary. <clears throat> Note that a sample of solid water or ice at a temperature slightly below the normal melting point will cross the solid-liquid phase boundary and melt as pressure is increased. This is one of water's unusual properties. I like the way she says that. The critical temperature is the temperature above which a gas cannot be liquefied regardless of the amount of pressure applied. The critical pressure is the pressure necessary to liquefy a gas at the critical temperature. The critical point is defined by the critical temperature and the critical pressure. Note that there is no phase boundary beyond the critical point. A substance in this region is known as a supercritical fluid and has properties associated with both gases and liquids. So guys, what I'd like to do is I'd like to go back and I'd actually like to pick this apart piece by piece. So we'll do this together um, and then we'll sort of flesh this out. But let me grab, well, I'm, I have to leave it like this because I'm going to be drawing some. So guys, let's go through this again and let's make sure you understood each of those little details. ...under which a substance is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Okay, so let's talk about this. Guys, what is the x-axis on this graph? Temperature. What's the y-axis? Pressure. So does it make sense that substances are solids at low temperatures? Sure. And then we understand that in this mid-range of temperatures, things are liquids, and then at high pressures, they're gases. But guys, you'll notice that the gas boundary, well, the gas phase, sneaks all the way down here to really low temperatures. But in order for a substance to be a gas at a really low temperature, what also has to be true? Really low pressure. Okay, so with that as an understanding, let's keep going. The lines that separate the phases are called phase boundaries. So let's talk about that. So these are the phase boundaries. So guys, what do we call the phase boundary between liquid and solid? If we're moving in this direction, it is called melting. This is called freezing. What about here? Liquid to gas, boiling. Gas to liquid, condensation. What about solid to gas? 
sublimation, gas to solid, deposition. So guys, these are the phase changes that we've been talking about throughout this unit. Continuing on. At any point along a phase boundary, the phases exist in equilibrium with one another. For example, in the phase diagram of water, at one atmosphere of pressure and 100 degrees Celsius, liquid water and water vapor exist in equilibrium. So guys, does that make sense? This is the phase diagram for water. We'll talk about how it's different than others later, but guys, look what happens. At one atmosphere of pressure, carrying this across, we cross this phase boundary at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. This represents water boiling at sea level at 100 degrees Celsius. Now guys, here in Orem, where are we relative to one atmosphere, above or below? We're below. Our, our elevation is higher, our pressure is lower. We see then that water boils at a lower temperature here at a lower pressure. Does that make sense? Okay. Come on. Oh, am I drawing dots? Oh, there we go. This point is known as the normal boiling point of water. Likewise, the temperature at which solid and liquid You okay with that? Okay, let's keep going. water are in equilibrium at one atmosphere of pressure is known as the normal melting point. The point at which all three phase boundaries come together is known as the triple point. Let's talk about this. So guys, this spot right here is called the triple point. For water, it is at 4.58 torr. Is that high or low pressure? What is standard pressure? 760. This is four and a half. That is almost a perfect vacuum. And then guys, look at the temperature. 0 0.0098. Relative to our experience, crazy cold, crazy hot, what is that? It's basically the temperature outside right now, right? Because 32 Fahrenheit, which it is about out, although right now it's like 50, but if it were 32 Fahrenheit outside, that would be zero Celsius. This is 98 ten thousandths above that. So guys, the conditions that we're talking about for water are fundamentally a cold winter day in outer space. Four, four tor out of 760 for one atmosphere. Guys, so this is not terribly cold, but it's wacky low pressure. So the question then is, what happens at that magic set of conditions? Well, we reach what's called the triple point. What does that look like? Well, guys, what would it look like if you had water at the triple point? Well, here's what you'd have. If you had a container with water in it at its triple point. So the boxes are the ice cubes, the water's in, the ice is in the water, and you got the vapor up top. If you are at 0 0.0098 Celsius and 4.58 Tor, what does this system do? Nothing. But what is it doing? Everything. It is boiling, condensing, subliming, depositing, melting, and freezing all at the same time and the net change is zero. Guys, that is what is called the triple point. Does that make sense? Okay, let's keep going. This corresponds to the temperature and pressure combination at which all three phases of a substance exist simultaneously in equilibrium. When a sample of solid water or ice at one atmosphere of pressure is heated, it will melt when the normal melting point, zero degrees Celsius, is... Now guys, this is something they're going to get you on on the test. Do you understand what they're showing here? So what they're saying is you've got a sample of water at one atmosphere of pressure. 
And it started at some temperature down here. And then we're increasing the temperature. As we increase the temperature, the point represented on the graph is traveling to the right. And then we hit that phase boundary. And what does the substance do? That represents melting. So down here, we are a solid. As the temperature goes up at constant pressure, eventually we hit that point at which it melts. If we kept going, the liquid would continue to heat until it boils at 100 Celsius. Does that make sense? Okay, now try this. What? Because you'd be surprised at how much of this gets mucked up in your brain when you're taking a test. At this point, water crosses the solid liquid phase boundary. If the sample is heated further, the liquid water's temperature will increase until it reaches the normal boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius. It will then vaporize, crossing the liquid gas phase boundary. Once the liquid is all vaporized, the temperature of the water vapor will increase as more heat is added. It's a weird pause. If a sample of solid water is heated at a pressure... Okay, you guys okay with this one? That if we heat uh, ice at a temperature... Sorry. If we heat ice at a temperature below the critical point, guys, as that happens then, the solid will go right to the gas phase, which we call sublimation, and it won't go through the liquid phase. So again, we talked about the idea relative to carbon dioxide, which we call dry ice. So what do we then know about the triple point of carbon dioxide? Well, first of all, do you see what we're saying? That if we are at a temperature below, if we're, I'm sorry, if we're at a pressure below the pressure of the triple point, this substance can't exist as a liquid. It goes straight to the solid or to the gas phase. So guys, if this were carbon dioxide, so if this is one atmosphere, so if this is one atmosphere for carbon dioxide, we know that the triple point of carbon dioxide is above one atmosphere because we know from experience it sublimes. We call it, car we call it dry ice. Does that make sense? Were you going to say something, Rebecca? Okay, so, it, it, well, you'd have to be well below sea level. I'll show you the, the, trip, the, the phase diagram for carbon dioxide. Right. So, could, but yeah, could we make carbon dioxide exist, exist as a liquid? And the answer is yes, but we, that's a great question. We'd have to increase the pressure to above the triple point pressure. Yeah, great question. We'll look at it in a minute. Okay, so I may just forward through this a little bit. You're below the triple point. Okay, so guys, let's talk about this one. So now we have a liquid, we have a substance in its gas phase. Now we're not going to change the temperature, we're going to increase the pressure. What will it do? Yes, it will condense as it crosses the gas liquid phase boundary. Did you see that? So guys, if we take this, if we take a gas and squeeze it, it will liquefy. And you understand that's what's going on in here, right? If you, can you hear it? Can you hear that this is a liquid? This is actually liquid air. They take air and they pump it inside this at such high pressure that it actually liquefies which made me think this is really cool. This is not a tank of air. This is a tank of helium. And it is under ridiculously high pressure. But guess what? It doesn't liquefy. How about this? 
helium molecules are so, helium atoms are so nonpolar that you can actually squeeze them hard enough to get them to go down inside this canister. And even squeezing them that hard isn't enough to get them to liquefy. Isn't that cool? I considered on the test having you draw what the phase diagram for helium must look like dependent upon that, but I thought that would be mean. Go ahead. It actually does, and it's surprisingly not many. Um, it's really sad. It's like 10. Um, I know, it really is. Um, no, it's actually all the helium that I need to fill my Wublix ball. I have no idea. Anyway, so guys, two more things we need to talk about. So guys, I don't, sorry, shouldn't have brought it out. So guys, there's two more things we need to talk about. This one's interesting. So now we've got water as a solid. This is an ice cube. But guys, we are not going to heat the ice cube. We're going to leave the temperature alone. What happens if we squeeze it? So guys, hold on. Here's the problem. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have got these out. Now you're grabbing phones and Googling wobble balls focus. So guys, this is the stuff you need to know. So come back. So here's the idea. So now we've got solid ice. It's at slightly below zero, which is still just kind of the temperature outside. But what we're really describing here is an ice cube. And guys, what happens to an ice cube if we squeeze it? Well, we're not heating it. But what happens to an ice cube if we squeeze it? What direction is that dot going to go when we squeeze it? It's going to go up. And guys, if you take this ice cube and squeeze it, it melts. That's how ice skates work. Guys, when you ice skate, you are actually not ice skating on ice. As that blade scoots along the ice, it is so concentrating your weight into such a small area that the pressure goes up so much that it melts the ice under your foot. So you are actually gliding on a small thin layer of water as your ice skate melts the ice as you're traveling across it. Now guys, why does this work? Think about it this way, and then we're going to transition. What does ice do when it freezes? It expands. So what would you expect it to do if you squeeze it? It would melt. Because, guys, think about this. If freezing causes expansion, anti-expansion would cause anti-freezing. So if it goes this way when it freezes, if you squeeze it, it melts. So guys, it turns out that water is the only substance that does this. Now hold that thought for just a second. And now let's talk really quickly about one other thing really fast. This idea of what is called a critical point. Guys, it turns out that there is a third phase change for a phase change. 217 atmospheres are not in core anymore. 200 times atmospheric atmospheric pressure and, and about 375 Celsius. Guys, guys substance, substance of water, water is this, the water, is water is conditions. Goes through goes another magic transition, transition, transition and it reaches, and it reaches what, is what is called the critical, critical point. point. Guys, at that temperature, temperature called the critical point, 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 the liquid and, and, and the liquid and gas phases become, become indistinguishable. indistinguishable. You can't, you can't squeeze it hard enough to get it to get liquefy. liquefy. You can't heat it, it up enough, enough to get it to get turn it into a gas. gas. It is it simultaneously, is simultaneously both, both a liquid a and a gas. gas. The, the name, name of it is what is called a supercritical, supercritical fluid. fluid. 
Now, guys, here's the thing. You hear about this, and you're like, wait a minute. This must be what, like, the Starship Enterprise runs on, right? It's, like, full-on, like, science fiction. Well, guys, here's the thing. Supercritical fluids actually have really interesting applications. The one that they mention in the book is actually decaffeinating coffee beans. I know that in Utah this has less of a context, but guys, the deal is it's really hard to get the caffeine out of coffee beans because you can get the caffeine out of the bean, but the problem is, is you also end up dissolving the oils and that's where the flavors are. So in order to dissolve the caffeine out of coffee beans, but not the oils, what they do is they actually soak coffee beans in supercritical nitro, or I'm sorry, carbon dioxide. They soak them in supercritical carbon dioxide. The supercritical fluid dissolves the caffeine without dissolving the oils. And then you remove the coffee beans from the supercritical carbon dioxide. The caffeine's gone and the oils are still there and you've decaffeinated coffee. So it talks about it in your book somewhere. But guys, understand these are not science fiction. It's actually a real deal. Okay, so guys, with that said, go back here with me. You ready? Go back to this and watch close. So what is this representing? As we increase the pressure, what is the ice cube doing? Melting. Now guys, with that in mind, check this out. This is the phase, di these are the phase diagrams for water and carbon dioxide. So let's re-represent this. Here's our point, and as you squeeze it, it melts. But guys, what if we did something similar to carbon dioxide? When you squeeze carbon dioxide, dry ice, when you squeeze it, does it melt? Why not? What is the difference between the graph for water and the graph for carbon dioxide? Yeah, you're doing it with your hands. Guys, the phase boundary between solid and liquid for water has a negative slope. Why? Because water expands when it freezes. In every other substance, that line has a positive slope. Meaning that if you have a solid and you squeeze it, it doesn't melt. It actually stabilizes the solid and it'll be solid at even higher temperatures at higher pressures. And every other substance on the planet with those weird exceptions does this except for water. So guys, when you look at this phase diagram, how do you know that that one's water if they don't tell you? It's got that negative slope. Now watch this. Relative to carbon dioxide, down here is one atmosphere of pressure. Do you see now why carbon dioxide sublimates? So what would you have to do to get carbon dioxide to be stable in its liquid form? You'd have to compress it under five times atmospheric pressure. So Rebecca, you asked the question about going somewhere. It wouldn't be enough pressure. You'd have, to, you'd have to place it under five times atmospheric pressure, which you don't see even like Death Valley or something like that. So it wouldn't work. You get the ideas behind that? So guys, that's it. Let's review. We've talked about phase boundaries. We've talked about the phase regions. We've talked about the triple point. We've talked about the critical point. We've talked about the slope of the phase boundary between solid and liquid for water and all other substances. And we've talked about changes relative to temperature and pressure. That's everything that you need to know about these things. You guys good? Okay, yeah. So what is it that causes water, liquid water to be less dense? Yeah, so we'll talk about it uh, quickly. So guys, why does water expand when it freezes? And it is a unique bringing together. It's sort of like the perfect storm. So why does water expand when it, freeze, when it freezes? One is because it's so polar. The other reason is because it's so small. Um, and so if we look at ice, this is what ice looks like. And guys, the thing that's interesting about ice is there's a tremendous amount of attraction between these polar molecules. 
hydrogen forces, right? But the thing that makes water expand when it freezes is when it starts to form these structures, like if you can look at the water molecule that's in my left hand and right hand, as these things start to come together to form the solid, the repeated crystalline structure, they actually can get so close together that they also start to repel. The negative dipole of one starts to repel the negative dipole, not of an immediate neighbor, but a neighbor that's close enough by that it creates repulsion and you end up with voids inside the crystal structure. You don't get voids like that inside things like salt. The voids inside salt are relatively small, while the voids inside of, of ice are relatively large because they're such small and yet polar molecules. And it's these voids that get created inside that actually cause the ice to expand when it freezes. But it, fundamentally, it's a property of polar and tiny. So even NH3 doesn't do this. An NH3 molecule is big enough that it will still contract when it freezes. Go ahead, Ty. Yeah, they're just polar enough that they attract and yet repel. Yeah, they're not as, exactly. They're not big enough to make the net substance expand as it becomes a solid. Yeah. Wait, water doesn't? Is that like water, liquid water? Oh, right, yeah, because they never get aligned enough to create the repulsion because the repulsion immediately causes flipping, where here they can't flip and they just push. Is that okay? That's pretty cool. No, go ahead. Well, probably. Yeah, but I, yeah. Okay, so guys, this is where we're going to wrap things up, but this is going to be for your own enjoyment. Um, we do need to talk about solids. I'm going to ask that you learn this by reading it, and then we'll talk next time, and you will have homework questions over it. Guys, what you're going to find out is that, oh gosh, what you're going to find out is that there are two types of solids that you need to be aware of. They are what are called crystalline solids and amorphous solids. Um, this is in chapter 12, 1 and 2. So guys, what I'd like you to do is give a read over 12.1 and 12.2 and familiarize yourself with crystalline and amorphous solids. In addition to that, you need to know the four types of crystalline solids. They are molecular, covalent network, ionic and metallic. Now guys, now I know I skipped through the previous slide quickly. You'll pick it up quickly as you read in chapter. We're not going to summarize chapter 12. It's all you need to get out of there. But I think you'll find that this is straightforward if I just give you examples. Molecular solids, an, an example would be sugar. Ionic solids are salts. Metallic solids is the sea of electrons. So what are covalent network solids? A great example is diamond. That may be helpful for you as you do your readings. And guys, that'll be posted in the screencast if you don't have a chance to write it down. So let me do this. Um, here, here's my, my back is kind of against the wall here, guys. I am going to have probably 20 to 40 people in my room in about six minutes. Um, we're doing pride remediation during pride and mine and Miss Call students are coming here. So we need to wrap this up. Check the screencast if you need, um, but guys, you need your homework. And, and no, we're not summarizing chapter 12. Um, oh. Oh, you know what? I actually pulled the home, the chap. You know what? We're not even going to have homework over chapter 12. Those few things. If you have questions, let me know. It's a minor thing. I didn't feel comfortable skipping it. Um